Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for, for having me here. It is uh, really a, a great pleasure to, to be here um, uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, I, I profoundly support the work of this organization. That They're terrific. I think Europe, uh, uh, England and Europe uh, need uh, these kinds of organizations. I think they're really important. Um, I'm also personally uh, thankful to the, uh, uh, the organizers of this for, um, uh, for inviting me. Um, and I also, I don't think I, I really need to tell you that this uh, org is doing work at what could not be a more important time. Um, I originally designed this talk when I was planning it out. I thought, well, you know, really I'm going to try to speak about the, the need for a digital rights movement, the need for digital civil liberties. I feel like all you need to do is pick up the paper. I mean, it's become a little ridiculous. <laughs> You don't really need, I could just throw that out here and get out of here. I, I think it's almost done. We're in a state where, you know, of, of absolute crisis in a sense. I mean, it couldn't be more important. It is um, the cause of our moment, digital civil rights. It has suddenly gone from being something that, you know, obscure people sitting in their basements seem to care about to something where suddenly people all over the world, the United Kingdom and the United States in particular, are waking up and saying, wait, someone's logging into my Facebook account and I don't know, seeing what I like, or <laughs> seeing my friends, or someone's reading my email, or listening to my phone calls, and I think we're just at a moment of absolute crisis, and so org is um, the kind of, you know, people forget how important these kind of organizations are until they actually, everything starts to, to come apart, and that's essentially what the thesis of my, my talk is. Um, I'm going to talk about the historic importance of uh, digital, they weren't always digital rights movements, but let's say rights movements in the media and communications industries. Um, this is roughly going to follow the outline of my book, uh, The Master Switch, um, which um, this is a small promotion, both the book and, and uh, <laughs> for the, but for org, and I'm going to say that if you sign up and become a contributing member, they will give you a free copy of the book, therefore freeing you of the need to, uh, to actually buy it. Um, but I, so I'll just, that's my little plug for uh, org. But I, I want to say um, that over the history of the media information industries, which presumably if you're here, you're interested in, amateur movements, regular people, um, entrepreneurs, small-time business, have had a profound and lasting impact on the course of history in ways that often get forgotten, often try and be erased, but cannot be denied by anyone who takes a serious look at the history of these industries. And I want to, in my talk, point the moments in history in, in, in the information industries where amateur and, 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 and grassroots movements have been essential, and then try and translate that to our present day. Try and see what could we be doing now, what should we be doing now, in order to maintain the sort of society that we might want to live in. And I say that because there is a profound history of amateurs creating, amateurs and, and grassroots women creating important new things, often in a very idealistic way, often in an effort to, to bring new technology, to bring openness, to bring new opportunities to people but a corresponding and highly disturbing tendency for those same technologies, those same movements to be perverted, twisted, and turned into tools of oppression, uh, surveillance, and sometimes, um, sometimes outright uh, uh, totalitarian op uh, uh, oppression of a society. And I'm going to describe how that's happened in history before and see if we can try and prevent it in our times. So let me start with the, uh, the radio, which I think is a template for, for all of this. Um, now, everyone knows who invented radio technology, but broadcast radio, the idea, very profound idea, frankly, uh, if you think about 120 years ago, there was no way for one person to talk to millions of people. That, that concept had not yet happened in history in, in a direct way. You could, you could write a book. Uh, you could distribute a pamphlet, but the idea at one moment that one person could reach 
thousands, well, thousands you could reach, millions of people at the same time had never <laughs> been thought of. And who invented this idea which ultimately comes to be, com becomes what we call the mass media? Who invented this idea? Well, actually nobody knows. Nobody is completely sure who was the first radio broadcasters. It could have been a teenager in California. There's some historians who believe that. It could have been a, an inventor in New York. It might have been someone in Pittsburgh. No one is exactly sure who the first radio broadcaster was, and that's because it was entirely the province of amateurs for the first decade of its existence. What we know isn't true is that it wasn't the Radio Corporation of America, the, the large uh, America's great radio monopolist in the 20s, although they did forge documents trying to make them look like the inventor of broadcast radio. Uh, in particular, their leader, David Sarnoff, wanted to appear as the visionary, but the fact was nobody really knows who invented radio broadcasting. In fact, one thing that's interesting when you look at the history... Uh-oh. That podium's starting to fall apart. Um, one thing that's interesting when you look at the history is how many inventions important, strikingly important inventions in media communications history that we don't know who the inventor is. And almost always the reason is, is that it was some amateur, some small-time figure who didn't happen to found a company. The ones who did found companies you know very well. I, Alexander Bell, Thomas Edison and the light bulb, um, and so forth. But the ones who didn't, the amateurs, don't get the full degree of credit because no one really knows who they were. So radio was founded by amateurs. Um, it was taken forward in the United States. It became sort of the idealistic movement of its time, rather like the World Wide Web in the 1990s. People believe that this medium, and then when people have talked about a medium in the 1910s and 20s, it was a new word that really meant something to them. We sort of say, oh, the media this, the media that. The me we use this word with it without really having a sense of what it means. Medium to people in this period was connection. People saw the radio as creating a possibility for a new type of connection between people that had never been achieved before. Like-minded people could suddenly share a different intimacy, a different kind of relationship with strangers that they had never uh, done before. The original radio broadcasting, by the way, I should mention, was always two-way. So you put on your radio microphone, someone would be giving a broadcast. That didn't mean pe people could ask questions or talk. It was two-way radio, very early amateur radio. Um, and there were very profound beliefs as to what radio was going to do for, for, for society. Uh, maybe a little exaggerated. People thought radio would uh, immediately replace the university. Why would anyone want to leave the comfort of their living room to learn things when you can have this sort of thing? Um, government uh, would be uh, immediately improved. I, I, met, I was recently reading an article, or not that recently, but I was reading an article in the 1920s that said, you know, once radio becomes the dominant technology, the age of the screaming politician is over. Because radio is such a dignified medium, you can't imagine. <laughs> you know, the, the irate screaming, angry host would just be laughed at, so then that would never happen. So there was a very, you know, sort of idealistic, and every communications technology that I've studied in this period after an, its invention tends to grow through a period, you can call it sort of the open period, the early golden age, one where there are profound hopes and dreams as to what this will achieve, one where people put faith in this technology to cure or ameliorate some of the problems that have plagued humanity forever. And I believe these moments, these movements, which are generally you know, not coming from the top, not, not designed by government or, or any company, profited from by companies, but not designed by governments, are, are profound because there are times where, even if it's a little utopian, what's wrong with, with hoping or trying to to seize on what could, could be better. And this is radio in the 1920s and um, was a, a wonderful thing. 
There's a slightly different history in the United Kingdom, um, although also idealistic, just in a slightly different way. Uh, I was reading a plaque, and I, I believe this to be the case. Someone might, uh, uh, might uh, correct me. That the early BBC broadcasts, this is when it's a British broadcasting company, were done in this area. And at the very beginning, I obviously, I, speaking about the BBC's history is dangerous for someone who's not English. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a certain, at least, idealism in the early uh, days of, of the BBC. The best of everything was their motto. And um, I, I think, once again, it expresses some of the spirit of what a new technology could be. So, that's the beginning. What happens next is what becomes cause for concern. So, radio in the 20s was distributed, highly decentralized medium. Um, and businesses and governments started to start to see how this technology could be improved. Several of the inventions were, first of all, the first chain networks. The idea chain radio chain network radio. Well, the idea went, you know, it's fine having all these small radio stations, but wouldn't it be better to have one kind of giant radio station or a big chain of radio stations, which all broadcast the same content, because then we can pool our resources and deliver higher quality programming. So the chain uh, broadcasting began a, a process of centralization uh, and, and this is particularly an American phenomenon, and homogenization and standardization of what radio content could be. Now, there's a trade-off. The advantage of... There's always the same kind of trade-off. The advantage of centralization, the advantage of con conglomeration, of putting everything together, was and remains higher quality stuff. And we're going to see this trade-off in the Internet itself. The big centralized uh, radio network in the United States, which was started by the phone company, AT&T, became uh, NBC, first of all NBS, then National Broadcasting Corporation, was able to offer higher production value content. Um, but at the trade-off, at a loss of this, some of the amateur spirits, some of the diversity, some of the uh, differences that made early radio um, uh, striking. But I think even if we speak of the, and, and, and if you go forward, fast forward through American history, you end up with a particularly American pattern, which is to say the entire industry ends up being conglomerated, concentrated in just two or three major companies. And that is the pattern. And once that becomes possible, the next almost inevitable thing that becomes easy is censorship. So... As soon as radio becomes concentrated, as soon as you have just a few companies in charge, uh, you start to see the first serious censorship of the radio. Now, some of it may have seen worthwhile. Um, one of the major early stations in Kansas City made all of its business by selling, um, this is not for uh, family audiences, um, goat gonads. <laughs> they had a strange thing where they would, um, in order to... Um, it seems that um, throughout history, if you want to sell people something, you need to sell men a virility pill. And <laughs> just like uh, penis enhancement ads are today, in the 1920s, it was goat gonad. Uh, uh, there was a strange surgery where a, a goat's um, gonads would be implanted into an adult man, supposedly to like enhance his uh, sort of pan-like nature or something. Um, so anyway, they shut this radio station down, which advertised that kind of things. But oh, over and over, I'll just say what becomes, you, know, you may not find them the most sympathetic speaker, but concentration makes censorship ever so easy. And where it really is alarming, the American story is sort of a, sad, a story of just corporate concentration. The really alarming story is what happens to broadcasting in Europe. Because in the 1930s, um, governments start to realize, and I mean here mainly the fascist governments, start to realize the real potential of broadcast medium. They take this thing, invented by amateurs, really only reaching thousands of people, and turn it into a device of the totalitarian state. And I'll, I'll quote, Goebbels had the, um, uh, one of the most impressive quotes in communications history when he said, I think very accurately, 
Uh, the radio is a spiritual weapon of the totalitarian state. Its goal is to unify the population. It is to eliminate ideological impurity. It can create a single folk. So the people who realize the most, the, the amateurs, the beginners, the idealists, they, they didn't realize what they'd created. It took Goebbels, the propaganda minister of Nazi Germany, to really fully understand the power of what had been created by these, these basement uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And I think that is also profoundly true in our times, which is to say some of the things which were invented for the internet, we do not realize the totalitarian, the inventors themselves in their college dormitories do not understand the totalitarian potentials of what they create. They're nice people, but when technologies pass, from one hand to another, the usage can change in profound ways. So Goebbels used um, radio to organize the German state. And the way they did it was very interesting. One thing they did is they passed out and made available to the population, in fact, enforced the ownership of, a particular government-issued radio called the Volkstrammer or something like that. I forget the exact name. And uh, in a preview of net neutrality uh, type of events, they designed this device so they could only tune into German radio stations. It blocked the British Broadcasting Corporation. It blocked Belgian, French station, uh, 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 radio stations. So they designed a receiver where the options uh, were limited. And then the final step, and this is harder to achieve today, is they set up a sort of uh, a Nazi version of prime time. Uh, they had an enforced listening hour every year, every day, where the entire population would sit and listen to the radio. Somehow we managed to achieve this in America without forcing people. I don't know how. We just, people did it sort of uh, voluntarily. But uh, they created a, a prime time, and ultimately the punishment for not listening to the radio every day was ultimately the death penalty, which takes things a little far. But I, <laughs> um, you know, not only out of the know... So, that is just the pattern. And, and I, I, you know, maybe this goes without saying that what we learn from the history of the radio is that amateurs, entrepreneurs, grassroots people who may start a new technology, may start and have dreams of something uh, open, idealistic, um, need to learn how to protect their invention need to learn ways to prevent taking this thing they've created and having it turned into the spiritual weapon of the totalitarian state. That is the lesson of radio, and that is the lesson I hope we learn with the Internet, which is to say we have created something profound, all-encompassing, incredibly intimate. The question is, can we prevent that technology, that from device, from passing into different hands and becoming a handmaiden of surveillance, totalitarianism, and other things. And, you know, this is a question of our time. So the people in the 30s, they lost. That, that is, you know, ultimately took a war to sort of turn things around. Um, uh, we have another chance with the Internet. Let me get to one or two more examples. I think maybe the most profound is... Um, is, is radio. But I want to also point out that, for example, um, the telephone, which is um, uh, another very profound technology, uh, was invented in the United States, but understood in its origins as a luxury service, sort of a um, thing for, for businesses or very rich uh, people. Um, a little bit, you might think of it as like a private airplane or something like that. It was only due to the efforts of very small-time entrepreneurs, people who would physically roll wire from one place to another inside small towns, that it became, that it became part of a universal understanding that it would be a mass network. It is, in fact, over history, typical that something will be invented and understood as a luxury item, and it takes a pro different kind of person, different kind of small business to move it into a mass product, and the telephone is exactly that. And in fact, some of the amateurs who did work in the early telephone are, are undercredited for what they, they did. Um, 
For example, I had said radio was um, you know, some of the first broadcasting. Some of the early telephone entrepreneurs uh, also had very primitive forms of broadcasting they thought of. Uh, for example, in some um, towns, radio became, uh, not radio, the telephone became a source of news broadcasting. How would this work? Well, at a certain time every day, telephone would ring ten times. The uh, recipients could pick up the telephone, and there would be played news, maybe a concert, this kind of stuff. So there, there was this early idea, this is about 1905, very early ideas of using the, uh, the, the telephone for uh, broadcasting, and essentially using wires for carrying uh, broadcasting. Uh, another technology which is important, also unknown inventors, is cable television, which um, in the United States at least is the backbone today of the broadband internet, which was, um, no one, again, there's a profound disagreement. Historians cannot agree on who actually invented it. And maybe it was simultaneously invented in different places. Um, uh, no, no, no one person. Of course, this again uh, ultimately became a much bigger uh, company. And I guess the, the other uh, big example of the 20th century of the role of uh, s smaller time or grassroots movement is, I think, quite obviously the personal computer industry and then later uh, accompanying it, it's the, uh, the first online networking. Um, it's another good question as to who really invented the personal computer. Uh, obviously, there's some candidates. Uh, Steve Wozniak comes to mind, some of the other figures. But this was, again, a very small-time operation. Um, IBM, which was then the, um, uh, the American monopolist of, of computers, mainframe computers, it was a very capable company in some ways, but you know, they never had this idea of, of computers that were for people. They had an idea of computers for institutions. And so bringing the technology to people often requires people who are operating under very limited constraints. When you talk to Wozniak uh, about, about um, you know, what went into making the Apple I, the first per one of the first personal computers, you suddenly realize that... Um, it was the fact he didn't have very much money that was so important to this invention. This, this incredible constraint he was operating under, that is to say, he, he didn't have that much money, partially because Steve Jobs cheated him out of the money he should have made with that game Breakout, which some of you may know. This is getting into deep geek history. But um, he had to try to build a computer with parts that cost around $1,000 or so. I can't remember the exact figure. And so it is often, this is why small-time in inventors can so often be so important is, uh, in making a mass technology, is because they want to build something for themselves. They're themselves in that situation where they're not building for, for um, you know, company with unlimited resource or government. They're building something for themselves and therefore face those constraints and therefore have to solve that problem. Um, you know, zooming ahead, uh, I, I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, it's a very interesting question is how the Internet became a uh, mass, something that people use. And when I mean people, I mean not just, although very capable and important scientists and researchers, not just big institutions. How did it actually become something that uh, the world uh, uses, and it's not something that just happened automatically. I think you have to look at the early history of the bulletin board systems, these sort of tiny operations with someone, two people with these slow modems. I, I ran one of these in my, my teens, actually, um, and um, I don't quite know how we got away with this. <laughs> we just <laughs> had some computer in our basement. People would call our house and I think it's because we had all the software you could want to download for free <laughs> on our system, but we ran this thing early. Uh, I think statute of limitations is over. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, again, this sort of, you know, this thing spread in a completely different way, and these are histories that are not uh, particularly well understood. Well, let, let's get to our, our present day. I want to leave some time for questions. The web is another great example of what we've talked about, and all of us, I think, have lived through the, the, the experience in the 1990s of this chaotic and, and new thing, the mass internet, the, um, the web uh, reaching uh, so many people, the TCPIP protocol. Um, and 
I think we have long presumed that because the web is different, because the internet is the internet, that somehow it had a sort of inherent automatic resistance to being used for, for questionable purposes. There is some truth to this. I agree that there is something about the protocols and their decentralization that makes them slightly harder to regulate. But I think now we're at the point where, I mean, I just pick up the newspaper. As I said, we can no longer kind of rest on the laurels and assume the Internet will be this way. And I don't, maybe if you're here at this meeting, this meeting I, I, maybe you are already convinced of this. We can no longer hope that just because there was a very clever feat of engineering in the 1970s and 80s done to make this network of networks, that this network will not itself become a profound tool of oppression, a profound tool of surveillance, a profound tool for the oppression or the uh, control of people. Any device designed to liberate can be used to enslave. And that is the challenge we face today. The internet has gone through, and when I wrote the master switch, it was earlier in this stage, I, when I was writing in 2007, I was writing about the possibility that the internet could start to see some of the same patterns we saw in television, uh, telephone, radio, and other mediums. Now I think it's unmistakably clear that it has moved from a sort of uncontrolled, highly disparate radio in the 1920s type of medium into one which is increasingly controlled by a handful of companies. And one which is easily accessed and is being used for purposes other than what we might think uh, are those that we want. And I'm not only, and, and I'm speaking about both levels, both at the level of carriage, movement information, and of the, at, the, at the level of handling of our information. And I mean here the great app monopolists, most of which began as darling, cute, attractive companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, the rest, but have grown, as companies do, into, into highly concentrated, uh, highly organized uh, uh, owners of our data. And I, th I think that we, in fact, we're past the, the point where the movement can prevent this from happening altogether. We're past the point where we can somehow sustain uh, the internet uh, as this kind of s s collection of unending competition, small businesses, and we need to ask what we can do now. Well, let me describe four things um, that hopefully we can do, four or five things we can do, essentially to prevent the history of the internet becoming the history of radio. And uh, first of all, this is one thing that I think is, is, let me talk about four things. The first thing I think that is uh, slightly uh, missing in the internet space, or the web space in particular, not completely absent, but slightly missing, is the sense of using consumer power to promote alternatives. Now what I mean by that is that I think people have come to, to be very clear or very um, aware of the effect of their buying decisions when it comes to a variety of products. Uh, I've been living in Cambridge for the last uh, month or so and a great you know, a number of people I know, they always go to the free house pubs, for example. They like the free, you know, the, the, that aren't under the control of the, uh, the, um, uh, the central distilleries. I know many people in America who will sort of never go to Starbucks, even though, you know, it might be convenient, go to other places. They, they avoid, they, 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 they seek out alternatives. They want to support the alternatives. But where is this in the online world? There's some of it. I, I, there are sort of more hardcore engineers who... Everything they use is, is, is encrypted, and, and uh, they never do anything, but uh, they, they won't use graphical user interfaces. You know, I have a lot of respect for that kind of thing, although it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, 
But I mean among average consumers. You know, average consumers, more average consumers who are not the highly tech elite, don't have this idea. Everybody uses Google. Everybody uses Facebook. Everybody uses Twitter. There's, and it's hard not to, frankly. But it's also hard not to automatically go to Starbucks, automatically buy a Budweiser or, or a, a, you know, the mainstream beer, automatically uh, go to the concert of the, of the most popular band, automatically tune to the most radio, uh, popular radio station. There's not a lot of consumer alternatives uh, or consumer power to promote alternatives to the main accumulators of data. And I think that's the kind of thing that uh, the cons use, consumer power needs to be used to try to start to split up data again. The second thing that needs to be done, and I think this is why I profoundly support the work of ORG, and of course uh, some of the American equivalents like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is to insist and defend legally and uh, publicly and by complaints a sense of what our rights are in this environment. Now, the trick with rights, and I speak about this as a lawyer, is that when you are in a slightly new context, it's always not so clear what your rights should cover. There's always this problem, Larry Lessig uh, put it best, of translation, of trying to figure out what it should mean. Um, you know, what are your rights in this area? Everyone knows you uh, have a, you know, everyone, everyone knows you have certain rights in the physical environment. Everyone understands, for example, what it means to have privacy in your home. But to really profoundly and identify and establish rights, particularly for the kind of intrusions that don't feel visceral. You know, what does it feel like to have your phone call listened on? Well, you don't really notice it at all. It's not quite the same as a, as a policeman uh, uh, coming through your house. But I think you do sense that at some level, or when you read about it, you have this kind of creeping sense that maybe you better behave yourself a little more. And that is a very destructive feeling, that sense that you should always assume. I, I hear people say sometimes, you know, you should always assume you're being watched. What kind of person does that create? If you're a kind of person who's like, well, everything I'm doing is being watched. I mean, it, it leads to a very boring kind of person. I sometimes think that, um, I don't know if you ever, uh, I, I used to live in Washington various times in my career. So many people in Washington have this idea that um, one day they're going to be appointed to some important government position. And uh, then they'll be having to answer questions about their past. And so because of that, they never do anything interesting at all. <laughs> They sort of have like their Senate confirmation in their mind. And um, you ever been to D.C.? It has some of the worst parties of any <laughs> place in, in the world. I mean, if you spend, you know, 60 years of your life waiting to be confirmed, that means you like, start living at age 70 when you're sure you're not going to be said to something, and that makes it a very dry life. And I, I think we could extend that to, to, all, 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 to our entire society. I mean... Once you get the sense, well, you're always, you might always be being watched, uh, it just really changes how you behave, and I think in, in ways that are horrible. Um, so really trying to get an idea, but also get an, a sense of ownership. I mean, people have a visceral, deep sense of ownership in their own homes, in their own personal space, but have that, develop that same kind of visceralness for things like, uh, you know, your data, for things like the uh, importance of being able to reach the, the, um, the, the content you want, which is net neutrality. Net neutrality says that I, as an Internet user, should be able to go wherever I want, not where the carrier or someone else wants me to go. Having a deep sensitivity to these interferences with what you want to do, with your freedom, it takes a little bit of work. But when you, when you get them and you crystallize them, that's really important to trying to defend uh, our freedoms in this area. Uh, something I'm working on recently, which I'll add to this, is this idea of trying to understand our attention as our own. What I mean by that is there, every day, we walk down the street, we spend time online, there are thousands, millions of attempts, I don't know, millions a day, but let's say thousands of efforts to try and grab some of your time, grab some of your attention, force you to watch some little screen on the the, the, the Paddington, the Heathrow Express is this new thing where they have like 
a, a, t a little TV blaring at you or something. All these little efforts to sort of grab what rightfully belongs to you, which is your attention, your time being taken from you. This is another thing I think we need to become profoundly aware of. This is actually a topic of my next book. Um, which, uh, and so d doing that process, I think, is really important. And I think org is doing this, lawyers around the, the world, but even regular people need to sort of try and articulate and define a consciousness of what our rights are in this environment and what it means for them to be violated. Um, third, and I guess this is really closely related uh, to, the, to the second thing, um, my experience with, with uh, net neutrality, which I've been involved in the last 10 years or so, uh, has made it clear that the most important things, and I say this from having been inside government as well as outside it, is that people, once these rights are articulated, that people complain and complain a lot when they feel their rights are being violated. Bad things happen when people don't complain, I guess is all I'll say. That, that's where the badness flows immediately, to where people aren't complaining. Where people are complaining, uh, where there's transparency, where there's potential media attention, government and companies, they kind of start to say, let's, let's just stay away from this. This looks like a troublesome area. And sometimes it seems like your complaints are going nowhere, but it really doesn't take that much for people, someone to decide, yeah, maybe I should better go somewhere else. Maybe, you know, this is, this is just not going to be worth it. So even that small act of complaining about things can really, I think, uh, be important. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is, and this happens to us over and over through the, the, the history of communications, is we can't help being seduced by better products, more attractive stuff. I talked about radio, and how is the conquest of radio achieved? Frankly, by really nice... Um, Things like soap operas and TV, uh, good, good, good shows and interesting concerts. The, the grand centralized media were able to offer pretty great content because they had more resources. And I think similarly, um, as consumers, we're always being seduced and, and, and willing to give so much away for, for, for great stuff. And it's, it's a hard trade-off. Like I said, you know, Many of the, the great web companies today offer some really great stuff uh, for free. Some, uh, I don't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, my point is, it, it's difficult, but uh, our, our capacity to complain, we often get seduced by the availability of, of, of the products of centralization. And finally, the, the last thing I, I, uh, I will say is that at some stage, the only real way, once a technology has become something of a, a, an aid, agent of, um, of surveillance and, and su uh, oppression as opposed to a device of liberation, the only, at some point, it becomes irredeemable, and the only alternative and the most important thing is to start something new, is to blow the whole thing up and start again. And in our lifetimes, it may become true that the web or parts of the web just become completely irredeemable. It may even become possible, uh, this may be a little further out, that the internet itself just becomes irredeemable. In which case it is incumbent upon the movement, incumbent upon the smaller people, the, 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 the amateurs, the inventors, to invent what is new, to invent what is next, and to re-begin that process where we blow up that which has become big and rotten and abusive and move to what is newer and offers uh, a, new, a new hope. And so there is this internal cycle here and we have to make sure that that cycle does not become stalled forever. I mean, we have to make sure that the next replacement with fresh idealistic people, and there's nothing wrong with the people working at these other companies, it's just anyone doing the same thing for too long becomes slightly corrupted. Um, you need, we need, to remember that we have to keep moving, break things up, support the next thing, whatever that is, whatever shape it takes, and not be too content with what we have. Thank you very much.